Now that we've learned how to integrate scalar valued functions over surfaces, we get to talk about integrating vector fields over surfaces. And I'll quickly remind you of the main steps for evaluating one of these vector surface integrals. The notation is similar to the scalar case. We'll have a double integral with an s underneath to indicate that we're integrating over a surface. But this time the integrand is a vector field f, and rather than multiplying by ds, we're dotting with some d vector s quantity. Now one difference in the vector case is that the surface we're integrating over is an oriented surface. An orientation on a surface is a choice of normal vector at every point. So a surface that you'll be given in one of these problems will come equipped with a normal vector pointing in a specified direction. And this will be important for evaluating it. And that's the main difference here. The overall steps are very similar. We start out by parameterizing the surface just as we did in the scalar case. This means we'll write x, y, and z in terms of u and v and we'll have to specify a parameter domain for u and v. And the main difference now is that we need to make sure the normal vector for the parameterization points in the same direction as the orientation of our surface. They need to match up. What that means very particularly is that the u derivative cross the v derivative Given that our parameters are presented in the order u, v, this cross product needs to point in the same direction as the orientation vector. This is usually the most subtle part of these problems, and we'll get some practice thinking about this in the examples. But for now, I'll just say you have to parameterize the surface and also care about your orientation. And then we compute the normal vector just like we did before. And then also, like before, we just take the surface integral and turn it into a double integral. The way we do that this time is by taking the dot product of the vector field with the normal vector. In the scalar case, you multiply by the magnitude of the normal vector. But in the vector case, you don't need to do that. Again, this is completely analogous to the line integral case. And also like before, this expression looks a little funny, but it really is just a double integral. And from there you do whatever you need to do in terms of double integral techniques to evaluate the integral. Okay, let's look at an example. Here, s is the portion of the surface x equals y squared minus z squared, which is contained in the cylinder y squared plus z squared equals 1. And the problem says that we orient the surface with a normal vector pointing in the positive x direction. So don't worry too much about that yet, we'll get there. The point is, is it's some oriented surface. And what the problem wants us to do is compute the flux of some vector field through the surface. And then there's a hint which, again, ignore it for now. We'll use it when we need it. The first remark to make is how do we compute flux? Previously we have talked about flux through a curve, but that was a purely two-dimensional phenomenon. Now we're talking about flux through a surface, but it shouldn't be surprising that this is just the surface integral of the vector field. It's just a physicist's way of describing what this integral is calculating. So that's all the problem wants us to do, it just wants us to compute the vector surface integral. So we need to start out by parameterizing the surface. And the key observation here is that x is a function of y and z. So this is a scenario where we could let y and z be our parameters and then x is chosen for us. If I call y u and z v, you don't have a choice, x has to be u squared minus v squared. And this gives us a parameterization for the surface, or at least a formula. 
So I'll call this G and then I'll write U comma V. And this is subtle, but this order that I wrote U and V in matters. We'll worry about it in a second, but you do need to think about the order that you're writing the parameters in because this is what gives you the orientation. Anyway, we'll come back to that. The formula is X, Y, Z, so it'll be U squared minus V squared, U and V. But as always, we need a domain for the parameters. This is going to come from this cylinder condition. We're told that the surface is contained in the cylinder y squared plus z squared equals 1, which means that y squared plus z squared is always less than or equal to 1. While y and z are u and v, respectively, so this gives us a restriction on u and v, namely u squared plus v squared has to be less than or equal to 1. That's our parameter domain. The surface is a little hard to draw, but it's given by a saddle point at the origin, and then we're cutting it out with a cylinder. So this honestly looks pretty similar to a Pringle. Here's my attempt at drawing a Pringle, and we're told that the orientation should be given by a normal vector pointing in the positive x direction. That would look something like this. And so what we need to do is we need to check that the orientation of our parameterization G matches the orientation of the surface. We can do that by computing the normal vector. Now this is where the order of your parameters matters. The normal vector is the cross product of the tangent vectors, but by definition, this is how the orientation of a parametric surface is defined the normal vector is the u derivative cross the v derivative in that order. Specifically, whatever order you write your parameters in, in the name of the function, that's the order you have to take the cross product in. So again, I'll talk about this more later, but let's just continue on. The u derivative is 2u, 1, and 0. The v derivative is negative 2v, 0, and 1. And so if you compute the cross product, you'll get 1, negative 2, u, 2v. And somehow we need to look at this and figure out if it's pointing in the right direction. In general, the kind of thought process you have here depends. But for our specific problem, we know that the normal vector should be pointing in the positive x direction. So we can look at the x component. And indeed, the x component is 1, which is a positive number. So that means this normal vector is pointing in the positive x direction. So this orientation matches the stated orientation of the surface, and we're in good shape. Now, before we move on, what if it didn't? What if the g of uv that we wrote down had the wrong orientation? You could fix it by instead considering g of v u. Literally just write down the same formula, but reverse the order of the parameters. Then you would compute the cross product in the reverse order, and you would get the negative of the normal vector that you got the first time, and that would point in the correct direction. That's all you'd have to do. I'll talk about this more in the second example, so we'll come back to this. Let's finish this off first. From here it's easy. We care about the surface integral of f. f, I'll remind you, was x, y, z. So when we convert this to a double integral, we get the vector x, y, z, well that's u squared minus v squared, u and v. And then I take the dot product of that with the normal vector that we computed. And our region of integration is u squared plus v squared is less than or equal to 1. It's the unit disk in the uv world. So then I'll multiply out the dot product. Simplify some of the resulting terms. And now we just have a double integral to evaluate. Because the domain is a disk, seems like polar coordinates are a good idea. 
So I'll let u be r cosine theta and v be r sine theta. And then at this point, this is just a polar coordinate problem. Our domain's a disk, so theta is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. r is going to go from 0 to 1. I plug those expressions into the integrand. Then multiply by the Jacobian, the r. I can pull the r's out to get r cubed. And then this is where that hint that I wrote comes into play. Sine squared minus cosine squared, we could rewrite using a double angle identity to get negative cosine of 2 theta, and that'll make the integration a little bit easier. So just to finish it off quickly, integrating the r part gives us a 1 fourth, and then the antiderivative of negative cosine of 2 theta is negative sine of 2 theta divided by 2. And then when you plug in 2 pi and 0, those terms are 0. So in the end, it looks like the flux through this surface is actually 0. The last example I want to do doesn't even involve computing a surface integral, it's just about orientation. We've gone through the evaluation process with both scalar and vector surface integrals a couple times and they're pretty similar and relatively straightforward once you have the parameterization. So like I've mentioned, usually the hardest part is parameterizing correctly. And in the vector case, we also have to worry about orientation. So here I only want to think about practicing parameterizing and practicing thinking about orientation. And we'll get to address this issue of changing the order of the parameters a little more carefully here. So in particular, I want to find an outwardly oriented parameterization of the unit sphere. So here's the sphere. It's looking a little egg shaped today. That's okay. Let's just not worry about the orientation for now and we'll come up with some parameterization of the sphere. Well, the equation of the sphere in spherical coordinates is rho equals one. So we could use the technique that I talked about in the previous video to, to get a parameterization, we can just impose this restriction rho equals one in the usual spherical coordinate formulas. By that I mean in spherical coordinates, x is rho sine phi cosine theta, y is rho sine phi sine theta, and z is rho cosine phi. So if I just plug in rho equals 1, we would get expressions for x, y, and z involving only theta and phi. And we could take that as our parameterization. So I'll call the parameterization g. And again, I need to write down an order of my two variables. I'll just pick theta and phi for no good reason. And again, don't think about it now, it's just something that we'll have to consider and come back to when we're talking about the orientation. So like I said, x would be rho sine phi cosine theta, but rho is 1, so that gives us sine phi cosine theta. Likewise, y is going to be sine phi sine theta and z would be cosine phi. And then to describe the whole sphere, we would send theta from 0 to 2 pi and then phi from 0 to pi. That'll be our parameter domain. Now let's compute the normal vector. Again, because I decided to write the variables in the order theta phi, for no good reason, I just felt like doing that. That means that to compute the orientation of this parameterization, we have to take the cross product in the order theta derivative cross phi derivative. We don't have a choice. That's the definition of the orientation of a parameterization. So I compute the theta derivative. I compute the phi derivative. I take their cross product, and then in the z component I can factor out a negative sine phi cosine phi, and I'll get sine squared plus cosine squared, which is 1, so that part simplifies a little bit. 
and we get this normal vector. All we have to figure out now is, is this outward pointing? Well, here it's not quite as obvious as in the previous example, because in the previous example, we just had to look at the x component, which was constant. It's very easy to see what direction it's pointing in because of that. But here we have variables flying around all over the place, and it's a little more difficult to just eyeball. So in this kind of scenario, a good technique is to just look at one point. Just find the tangent vector at a real point. And because orientations are consistent, if you figure out what direction that single normal vector is pointing, that'll give you the orientation of the whole surface. So almost any point would work, but I'll just pick, for example, when theta is zero and phi is pi over two. If you plug these values into G, this would give us the point one, zero, and zero. So that's the location on the sphere. But what we care about is what the normal vector is at that point. So I'll plug in zero and pi over two for theta and phi respectively into this normal vector expression. Sine of phi is one, cosine theta is one. So the first component will be negative one. And sine of 0 is 0, so the second component is 0, and cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so the third component is 0. So it looks like the normal vector here is negative 1, 0, 0. Ah, and if I plot this on my egg here, at the point 1, 0, 0, which is about here, the normal vector is pointing in because it's pointing in the negative x direction. So this normal vector points inward, which tells me it's not the correct orientation. We were looking for an outwardly oriented sphere. So how do we fix it? Do we have to go back to the drawing board? Nope, it's a very easy fix. Because changing the order of a cross product changes the sign of the resulting vector, all we have to do is just do something to ensure that we take the cross product in the other order. But the subtlety here is that the only thing that we're allowed to do is change the parameterization. You can't just willy-nilly take the cross product in the other order. Again, by definition, the orientation of a parameterization is the cross product given in the order that you write the variables. But the point is, is you could just reverse the order that you write the variables. Instead, I'll consider g of v theta, and then I'll literally use the same formula and same domain. That part doesn't change at all. The only thing I've changed is the order that I write theta and phi. Seems a little silly, but again, it's just what we have to do based on the definition of an orientation of a parameterization. But now when we compute the normal vector, we'll do the phi derivative cross the theta derivative. And we already did the cross product above. I know that permuting the order, we'll just introduce a negative sign. So we'll get this vector. I don't have to do any more computation. And I also know that this one will be outward pointing because the other one was inward pointing. And there you go. This is an outwardly oriented parameterization of the unit sphere.